officially start the um, interview of Mr. John C. Joe, MD, MPH, Chief Executive Officer of Vigor Medical Systems, Inc. in Houston, Texas. John, start off and tell us a little bit about yourself personally, your background, and a little bit of your professional overview, your studies and specialization. Sure, I'll just go in chronologic order. Perfect. Um, as you mentioned, uh, I'm in Houston, Texas, and uh, I went to university here uh, in Houston and then uh, went out of town for medical school, uh, but still within the state of Texas, and then came back to Houston to the Texas Medical Center for my training after medical school. Um, first trained in general surgery for a year, and then uh, in family medicine um, in the U.S. Uh, family medicine is a three-year residency uh, training program after medical school. Um, other parts of the world may call this uh, general practitioner primary care, okay. um, but we have formal study in uh, internal medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, pediatrics, surgery, um, and a number of specialties like cardiology, pulmonology, and so on. So uh, broad background, and then I've been interested in population health and looking at how to improve not just individual patients and you know, people's health, but uh, groups of people. And so I think a master's in public health as well. Mm. Uh, learned some statistical methods and administrative and research tools uh, during the program. I went on to start off in private practice in the U.S. in primary care for a few years, uh, but then was recruited back to Baylor College of Medicine, where I did my family medicine residency. And um, when I uh, joined the faculty, uh, I was uh, both a teacher, administrator, and uh, direct the frontline patient caregiver. So <clears throat> in wearing those multiple hats, um, I, I had uh, broad uh, range of uh, work that I did. Uh, the administrative work, though, uh, was um, very interesting because it ended up leading me down a different path in my career than most of my peers, um, from private practice as well as academic medicine. One of the things I mentioned earlier, I'm interested in population health. Um, one of the things I, I secured funding for as, as a condition of taking the position uh, at the, the medical school running the clinic, uh, was funding for an electronic uh, record system. Now, this was in the late uh, or mid-90s when software was still in relatively uh, its infancy. And uh, but I got the funding, nevertheless, and we implemented the software. But after more than a few occasions of being at the clinic at 8 o'clock at night, uh, along with some of my colleagues uh, who, who worked for me in the clinic trying to finish our records on the computer system, I thought there, there's, there must be a better way. This is not sustainable. And so one of those uh, ways was actually to have the patients. You know, the internet was just in its infancy at the time. This, mm -hmm. was, this was in 1997, and uh, the internet bubble was just starting to, to, to grow. It, it wasn't uh, anywhere near bursting yet, um, but uh, there were portals uh, that were available in other industries, but not in healthcare. And so I approached some investors about uh, launching a company uh, to create that product. Well, anyway, I'm, uh, without going into all those details, I, we can get into that later. But, but um, I started down the path of becoming an entrepreneur, um, starting a internet uh, business, or one of the first digital health businesses in the U.S., uh, while maintaining my faculty position at Baylor, and uh, you know, continued for another uh, 20 years as an entrepreneur position until recent years uh, when I retired from the faculty practice and focused on consulting and on being a serial entrepreneur. Okay, that, that's interesting. And I'm, I'm going to diverge, but I know you have a strong involvement in technology, but that is not something that you studied at the university level. So all of that expertise you developed and acquired after you joined industry and sort of developed that expertise yourself. Is that correct? Um, well, I did have a small foundation. Um, I uh, 
it was in this transitional time when I was in high school, I had started off uh, using the slide rule and punch card programming at the first half of high school. And in the second half, we got our first computer labs, the Apple IIs and Commodore 64. So I, I learned to do basic programming in high school. And when I went to university, uh, my first year at university was also the first year that that university had a computer lab, mm. um, a microcomputer lab for, for students. So um, instead of doing punch card programming, uh, as the previous classes had done, uh, I was able to take a couple of programming classes. Uh, it, it was really for fun back in those days, you know, programming video games and, and some other uh, routines. But um, after you know, two or three times up at 3 a.m. trying to find one or two characters. You were just at the point of being, speaking about being up at three o'clock in the morning before before things froze. So let's let's just continue on from there. I took programming classes uh, at university, but uh, that was uh, continuing a hobby that I had from high school. I was fairly focused on the career in medicine as I started the university. And after my second or third time being up at three in the morning trying to find one or two characters that I miskeyed that caused my, my loops or program routines to crash, um, it, it convinced me that I'm not going to be a programmer. But at the same time, I, I knew that computers are going to change the world someday. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I took those classes and kept them in the back of my mind after I went off to medical school. But um, there were tools that I want to leverage at some point. And, and after I became an academic and administrative position and began implementing software to help with uh, clinic efficiency and also research databases, outcomes improvement. That, that's when I started uh, doing more on-the-job training and learning. As oh. the technology came to market, you know, there's been ongoing learning as, as new things were released into healthcare, or actually other industries first. Yeah. Um, healthcare was slow to adopt, so, so I would continue to monitor uh, how technology was developing other industries and looking for ways to apply it in healthcare. Now, you've, you've obviously had a, a very strong involvement around the Houston area. What, what about since that time? Has your business become a little bit more international? You've been involved in consulting. Do you travel a fair bit to other locales? Yes, that actually started um, fairly early on um, in the you know, academic medicine, clinical research. Um, that's a, an international business. Uh, Publish and, and English language journals are um, read widely in different parts of the world. Um, in my case, it wasn't so much clinical research as it is applied to medical informatics. So uh, even uh, back in 2000, I remember um, my first trip to Singapore mm -hmm. uh, was for the eHealth Asia conference. I was invited to speak at that conference. I'd already been speaking at uh, conferences in the U.S. Uh, in the late 90s regarding the software that people method and some of the things that we were doing with technology in the clinic at Baylor or at the medical school. I started off as a clinic administrator um, and after implementing software in my clinic, we used that actually as a pilot site for the entire uh, medical college with all of its different departments and medical specialties. And so after, after the uh, electronic record system was deemed successful in my clinic, then we began rolling the software out in, in all of the other departments from okay. internal medicine to surgery and to OBGYN. And, and I ended up uh, moving from being medical director of my clinic to, to being the director of, of medical informatics or clinical information systems for the whole you know, Baylor College of Medicine. Okay. And, then, uh, and then at that time, we didn't have our own teaching hospital. We had many affiliated hospitals that were owned by other organizations and for our hospital-based care. And, um, and soon enough, uh, the, the management of those affiliated hospitals began uh, paying for part of my time from Baylor to help them implement information systems within the hospital setting and then also integrate our clinic information with the hospital information. And, uh, 
and I spoke at conferences about the work that we were doing with our institutions, um, and then people began inviting me further and further afield. And so then I ended up going to Singapore and London and Shanghai to speak at conferences. Um, and it was through speaking at those conferences that okay. people then would contact me <clears throat> afterwards uh, to consult for them in implementing systems the same way that our affiliate hospital here in Houston had begun to, to help them in the late 90s. Okay. Now, we're going to turn to Vigor Medical Systems in a second, which you're CEO of. But um, it, it sounds like you still have other peripheral activities. Vigor is not 100% of your time. How, how much is, is Vigor of your life and how much are you still doing other things these days? <clears throat> it's, um, uh, Vigor takes up the majority of my time, uh, but uh, for the last uh, 25 uh, or even maybe 30 years, I've, I've been a multitasker, I've always had uh, more than well, for, for 25 plus years, I've had at least two to three titles at any given time in any given organization. And uh, it, it's been helpful because um, it's cross-pollination of ideas. You know, I'm, I'm both a purchaser and consumer, as well as a vendor or supplier. So I understand both sides of both worlds. Um, and I'm also a user. I don't spend much time practicing medicine now, but I still fully licensed and certified and, mm -hmm. and maintain hospital privileges. So uh, I eat my own cooking, so to speak, and I understand what it's like on the front line. That's extremely helpful when producing products uh, for yeah. physicians or nurses uh, to understand the user experience that's required. Okay. So let's now turn to Vigor Medical System. Give us a, a general overview of the company, where it is currently, facilities, number of staff. Is it still in the R&D stage or is it operational? <clears throat> yeah, so um, um, just a, a, a quick background. Um, this uh, company's technology was invented at Duke University by the students there. And uh, they were friends of, of one of my kids who uh, attended Duke University, and so I was initially an informal mentor to them, and the university did a fine job of helping patent the technology, register a company, and obtain seed funding, and so they did the R&D work there, and, uh, and had an early prototype and complete clinical trials to prove the technology, and then uh, after they incorporated the business, I came on board as the vice president for software bringing my uh, digital health uh, expertise uh, to their medical device and technology expertise. Um, and then they had another person serving as CEO at that time, but, but uh, gradually I ended up replacing that person and became CEO. And uh, so um, this has all happened in the past um, four years or so. And uh, the, the company now is going through regulatory approval process for medical devices various countries for folks uh, for products. And then uh, we're also in the business development stage of forming partnerships with potential uh, distributors and go-to-market partners in different parts of the world. So it was a son or daughter that had the initial connection to Duke as opposed to yourself? That's right. Uh, that's right. I, I uh, uh, had uh, some very loose connections uh, to people there uh, in the academic medicine arena, um, but um, it was through my dog, in fact, that um, I became much more closely connected to, to people, um, classmates uh, who were the founders and inventors, um, and then with the faculty and members who were advising them. And so we, we actually have former chancellor of the university as one of our seed investors. Um, we have the head of the technology transfer office also as one of our investors. And I've since gotten to know a number of people of the group through the past few years. Interesting. So just as an aside, is is your daughter exploring a career in the, in the field of medicine as well? No, actually, um, uh, she is uh, completely in a different uh, field. Okay. She's, she's a professor at 
professional ballerina, as a matter of fact. Uh, mm -hmm. But she uh, had a, um, uh, in what they call um, interdisciplinary studies, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so part of, uh, in addition to arts, uh, she, she had business and digital media uh, experience. So, so she uh, helps us uh, actually uh, as our webmaster for the paper. Very diverse background. Interesting. D describe the the actual product or technology, um, how it works, how a person would use it, what it does, the the type of person who would be best suited to to use it. So uh, let me draw an analogy. Um, and most people know somebody that has diabetes, um, where there's you know, abnormal blood sugar control. And uh, most people with diabetes uh, will need to check their blood sugar with a finger stick device. Um, and then they have to modify their diet and take medications, uh, sometimes uh, including injections of insulin to control the, the blood sugar. Yeah. Um, so diabetes is a chronic disease. And uh, you measure it, monitor it, uh, and then you treat according to objective data. And uh, for lung diseases, the, such as asthma, chronic, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as asthma, and then others like cystic fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis. Um, the, uh, the conditions are much harder to, to measure. It's, the treatments are primarily based on how someone subjectively feels. Am I short of breath? Am I feeling tight in my chest? And decreased in capacity in my lungs? Am I feeling bad? My coughing up a lot. Um, so it's difficult to titrate medications to properly manage the disease facing uh, on subjective uh, symptoms rather than objective data about the patient. Um, if you go to a clinic, there will be devices, sometimes the size of a refrigerator, mm -hmm. uh, that have tubes connected to them. And then you hold the tube to a mouthpiece, yeah. to mouth, and sometimes there's a clamp to close the nostril so that the air only goes through the mouth and into the tubing. And then you exhale as, as hard as you can or as long as you can, depending on the specific stage of the test. Um, and then that large device um, calculates your lung volume, and the flow rates, and a number of other parameters, no more than a dozen different um, they, those devices cost more than twenty thousand dollars each in the U.S. Um, prices are similar in other parts of the country, and adjusted for currency exchange rates. And in recent years, there have been some smaller versions that might be a little bit less accurate, that have been reduced down to the size of perhaps a laptop computer, with some peripheral tubing paraphernalia that you blow into, and those uh, equipment still cost a few thousand U.S. dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a result, uh, many parts of the emerging market uh, do not have spirometry equipment, and, and there's no uh, real equivalent to a glucometer for diabetes that people can carry around in the purse and pocket to check. There's something called a peak flow meter. Um, yep devices that can measure for about a second or so how much how force you can blow uh, out of the air. Um, <clears throat> but there's no um, portable equivalent of the lung function machines that you find in clinics and hospitals. Um, so what, what Digger has done, uh, what our founders did, uh, is actually find a way uh, to perform the full range of lung function testing uh, that you do with Five to twenty-five thousand dollar device that could be refrigerator size, and then compact that into something that you can hold in your hand or carry in your pocket, and then transmit that data um, through a connection to your cell from uh, into the cloud, so that uh, uh, the physicians that can monitor this interpret this kind of data can look at a, a dashboard anywhere from anywhere in the world and give feedback to the patient. 
Now, I'm very interested in the asthma application because I, I had mild asthma at one point in my life and I'm concerned maybe one day my, my daughter will. So is this sort of like a, a wearable that monitors you or is it sort of like once a day you, you blow into this machine? How, how does it, is it actually applied? It's a device that you carry with you, not, not necessarily wear. So you carry it in your pocket or your purse or keep nearby. Um, it's about the size of a cell phone uh, in terms of length and width. Um, it's thicker than a phone because it has a cylinder to which you attach a mouthpiece and blow air through. Uh, but our, our device has no moving parts. There, there are some efforts to create some of those um, laptop computer sized devices that have a turbine uh, in them uh, and that has some limitations and functionality and requires some calibration. Uh, so another aspect of Bender's device is that this technology doesn't involve any moving parts so it doesn't require any calibration. Uh, so, so it's something that you, you carry with you and that anytime, anywhere, you can measure your lung function status uh, and then determine whether medication might be needed at that time or not. Very interesting. Very interesting. So it's like a a very miniature version of the, the big blow in monitors that, that you talked about that anywhere that you feel maybe your your chest is tight you can you can do a test just to at that moment to see if, if there may be an issue. Is that the correct um, sort of usage? Yes, uh, that, that's right. So we have we have two targets. Uh, one is uh, the individual patient level, somebody that has a lung disease and needs to be monitored, or potentially somebody that's in a hazardous environment, or occupational health okay. exposures, um, and the minors or, or people exposed to asbestos or, or silica, um, environmental um, airborne particles that, that, that may cause damage to the lungs uh, over time. So you know, occupational health surveillance is another use for the personal device in addition to chronic disease management for people with asthma or COPD. But the, the other aspect is for professionals, for physicians. You know, I mentioned the cost and the size of spirometry equipment in the emer emerging market. Um, oftentimes physicians don't have access to uh, lung function testing for their patients. So, mm -hmm. so even the physician is making subjective diagnoses um, based on symptoms and maybe listening to the patient's lungs um, and not actually quantifying the volume of the lungs and, and the, the flow rates of the breathing in the various, in the various conditions. And so, so there's a large unmet uh, need um, in emerging markets for more affordable So the people who would use this, whether it's a physician or an individual user, when they do the test, so the, the information is, is going to, to vigor, so it, it's a private medical company that would do the analytics or, or give feedback, or would it go to a hospital? Who's, who's doing the diagnostics and, and giving a response to the patient or physician? So for the um, individual test, uh, you have a protocol that would be followed in the clinic or hospital with one of the large expensive machines. Um, this is a very similar protocol would be used on our mobile devices, and the data generated would be reviewed, um, could be um, seen on the screen as a professional device that we have, um, or if it's uh, uploaded to the internet, then it can be printed out uh, from the software. And the physician would make the interpretation, diagnosis, and staging of the disease the same way they would by looking at the report from the, the large, non-portable uh, devices. Um, but uh, what we do in, in accumulating the data, however, um, is looking at multiple tests over time for the same patient or comparing the population of patients that may have similar characteristics um, as, the, as the one that the physician is seeing at that moment. 
and by accumulating data over a larger population, look for patterns that, and associations. Um, so uh, one of our other products, besides the device, the software that displays the data to physicians and the patients, uh, is analytic. Um, so we have an artificial intelligence or machine learning component that looks at the uh, longitudinal data from the individual or the static data for a population of patients. Okay. Um, and as we look at that association, then we begin to begin to correlate the different factors that may be predictive of when the patient may experience a worsening. Um, and so that that's an additional product that will be released later. There will be additional regulatory approvals required for that type of software product. Um, but then, but that, then that's where value will come uh, in the future advance the, the state of care and, and advance the knowledge base uh, of lung diseases. And that should be a value for pharmaceutical companies that are developing therapeutics, and for researchers that are tracking what is effective in terms of, of drugs or other preventive measures for lung diseases. So you, you mentioned a moment ago it's going through the regulatory application process and in different countries. Um, which countries are you focusing on now, and when do you expect those first regulatory approvals will be given? So the, uh, the four largest uh, blocks uh, would be um, U.S. and Europe, and then uh, the other side uh, of the world, China and India, because of the, the sheer populations, and, uh, and also uh, the lack of um, equipment many parts of China and India. So, so we have um, Western Hemisphere and Eastern Hemisphere markets. Uh, those are the, the prominent ones. And the process for that uh, will probably take us through the second half of next year uh, before regulatory approvals are, are granted. And then there are a number of other countries um, in the Middle East and South Asia where there's high prevalence among diseases. Latin America and Africa. Um, so really, the, the global prevalence uh, for, for asthma and COPD, just those two conditions alone, um, there are more than half a billion people that are affected by asthma or COPD. Um, when we consider um, other lung conditions, um, as many as a billion or a seventh of the world's population uh, may have, uh, may be a target uh, user for our product. Is it just one regulatory application in the EU to get approval for all of the EU now 27 states? Yes, that's right. Uh, with, with Brexit, we'll have to go through a separate process for the UK, but for the EU countries, um, it's just one process. Okay. Now, this is interesting because I, I have a personal interest in Brexit. Have you started a new application just for the UK now that it's no longer in the EU? Uh, we, we haven't yet. We're, we're working with our legal advisors uh, on that. Uh, there is some possibility uh, as UK works with the EU that they may continue the same uh, regulatory scheme for medical devices at the EU, but we have contingency plans in place in case we need to do a separate submission. Um, so at the moment, um, we're working with our legal advisors and waiting for additional direction from them uh, before starting the process. So to practice... I think the UK hasn't... Go on. The UK, I think, hasn't decided yet uh, on this particular I, I think it's looking highly likely as a no deal. So I suspect if you want to use the UK, there may be a separate application. Just, just a personal opinion. <laughs> the, the, the rollout and the application. The first target market, are you going to sort of look at hospitals or physicians, or are you going to market directly to, to individuals? And then the second related question is, um, what about the physical manufacture of, of these devices? Presumably that would be done by some different company that, that may be a partner firm to you? Yeah, um, in, uh, in 
this day and age, um, it's becoming much more common to utilize the contract manufacturing services. You know, a decade or two ago, um, a startup company that's trying to manufacture a device, uh, particularly in the medical arena that's highly specialized, uh, may have to raise funds um, for the manufacturing process internally. Uh, but now there's a level of sophistication uh, in the global contract manufacturing firms uh, that um, it's more likely than not feasible to find a contract manufacturer in multiple countries who can create fairly sophisticated, specialized devices such as ours. So uh, we have not um, invested in any factories or uh, manufacturing managers. Um, we have some contracts with manufacturing partners and are continuing to speak with others um, so that we can try to source as close to our target market as possible. Um, given the uh, politics and economics uh, these days um, of trade and supply chains, um, we were starting started right off the bat planning on having multiple manufacturing sites across the, the world that are in close proximity or within our target markets. And and your initial customers, will they be sort of public health hospitals, individuals, all of the above? So we're looking at, um, at economies of scale and um, definitely not uh, marketing to individual physician practices. So we are looking at uh, larger organizations. And our target market um, is uh, the value-based uh, care market. And what I mean by that uh, is um, in the U.S. this is the most prominent because of the, the unusual and fragmented healthcare financing in this country. You have uh, the private insurers, you have the government and safety net programs, you have the non-profit uh, organizations that are both payer and provider. So the the, the history has been volume-based care. You get the provider, whether it's a physician or a hospital, hospital gets uh, paid on the basis of each individual count, encounter or procedure. Um, but uh, because of that uh, volume-based reimbursement model, America has the highest per capita health care expenses of any country in the world, yet achieves you know, outcomes that rank maybe below the 20th or 25th you know, among the countries of the world. So there has been a very steady shift in recent years uh, away from volume-based reimbursement and towards value-based reimbursement. So instead of paying on the basis of how many procedures were done, how many patient appointments they've had today, it's based on what are the outcomes, uh, both clinical and financial, how many times have these patients been admitted to the hospital or readmitted to the same condition um, if the patient uh, has been already been admitted multiple times within a certain window, um, then the payer, whether it's government or private insurance company, may not pay for additional uh, care. So so the, the emphasis is uh, slowly shifting towards prevention and, and wellness. Mm -hmm. uh, now, countries like uh, Canada, UK, and Australia with national health systems have already been value-based. There's a fixed pool of money for which to pay for health care, and that pool needs to be made to, to, to go as long and as far as possible. Um, so, so those can be considered value-based care organizations. So our device and software, by gathering data and optimizing patient's management, and then using the tools of data to determine patterns and predict when to intervene is totally aligned with the value-based care philosophy. So those are the types of organizations that we're going to approach. They may be insurance companies that also are providers employed, or they may be large provider organizations that contract with um, governments or private insurance companies that have the value-based perspective. Or they may be national health systems okay. that have to care for large populations with fixed tax-based revenue. 
I'm interested in that because having spent a lot of my life in Canada and the UK where there is a large public health care system, um, so you're depending on the country, may be targeting the private sector and other countries may be targeting the public sector. Presumably, the public sector may be one of the primary targets in China. Is that correct? Yes, uh, since you know, at, at present and historically, the government has been a significant payer for, for health care. Um, there's an emergence of the private insurance industry um, you know, with the growth of the middle class. Uh, but we're in a value-conscious environment. Uh, and I think that uh, even in the private sector, uh, there's going to be an emphasis on value-based care, but particularly with uh, the technology that's becoming available. Ability. I mentioned the diabetes example earlier. In China, there are already pilot projects to do remote management of diabetes using blood sugar meters mm -hmm. that will transmit data via Bluetooth to the patient's cell phones, which then go to a central monitoring center. And so the government has funded projects like that for diabetes management as well as heart disease management. And uh, in this year, in 2020, Chinese government elevated chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, to be one of the top five uh, national health priorities. Yeah. Um, yeah, COPD is, is probably the fourth uh, leading cause of uh, hospitalizations and death um, after cancer, heart disease, uh, and endocrine disease. So, mm -hmm. uh, so, so there's a, uh, a significant interest better managing, using technology to better manage one of these trials. So I think it's a very good time in the market. So you said that probably in the second half of next year, you'll be, you will have received some or all of the approvals and, and become operational. So when, when the company becomes more mature, say in three years time, what will be the particular services it does directly and what partners will it work with to deliver sort of the whole ecosystem of this? As, um, as we see that uh, the shift towards value-based care, um, we'll see that doctors' offices will shift their personnel to having care managers um, contact and following up with the patients to ensure they stay on treatment plans. But uh, we're enabling the digitization, and there are some companies that are, are doing this already with diabetes and, and with heart disease. And, um, in the U.S., there's a prominent company called Lavongo that is about, I think, six years old. Uh, they went public last summer, 2019, and uh, just last week, I believe, it was announced that, that they are going to merge with Peloton, which also went public last summer. These companies are good examples uh, of the shift of technology, Lavongo in particular, with chronic disease management, starting with diabetes. And uh, I know of similar companies in Asia. Uh, they've not uh, gone IPO yet, but I, I think uh, some of them will. Um, so you know, the, the equivalents or the parallels, rather, to Peladon uh, in the U.S., uh, the parallels in Asia would be Ping Hong's Good Doctor or uh, Tencent's We Doctor, uh, you know, the telemedicine programs, they are initially uh, geared more towards uh, urgent or acute care, but uh, they have also recognized the potential, the need in primary care and ongoing disease management. Uh, and they will need tools in different specialty areas for, for endocrinology or diabetes. Uh, there are some tools that are available in lung pulmonary care. There's hardly any digital health tools that are available, and so we aim to be the supplier to those markets in three years, um, in addition to supplying uh, national health systems and large uh, managed care or value-based care provider organizations with the technology tools to manage lung disease. 
you, as you said before, you'd probably outsource the, the physical manufacturing of the device, but presumably you'd remain at the center of, of the data analytics as opposed to outsourcing that. That's something that Vigor would always consider a core activity. Is that correct? That's right. That's, that, that's right. So whereas we uh, have contract uh, mechanical and electrical engineers, um, we employ our own data scientists um, and analytics uh, specialists. Okay, okay. I had a conversation earlier in the week with a, um, a biopharma company and I was, they were explaining to me the concept of CDMO and it sounds like there's an analogous con um, concept there. They were the CDO to produce the bio ingredients and all of these things. Your CDO will be the contract manufacturer for your physical devices. Is, is that a correct analogy? Over time, the, the devices can be, become commodities. Um, uh, someone else, uh, a, a venture capitalist that I spoke with, um, after I explained our, our business model, um, the venture capitalist uh, said, "Oh, I, I get it. You're, uh, in some ways, uh, you're like the inkjet printer manufacturers, uh, where they produce the device, but their recurring revenue comes from the sales of." Ink cartridges, um, and, and I said, uh, yes, in, in some ways you could view our devices over time as becoming a commodity, uh, and it's really the data stream coming from the devices and the intelligence that will provide the interpretation of that data uh, that is our source of recurring revenue. Okay, now you've just mentioned the involvement of the venture capital firm. You're the CEO, but uh, who who is the the owners? Of the company, is there a diverse group of of shareholders? So the the company is um, registered uh, in the U.S. and initially the founders uh, had um, were, the, were the shareholders. And they were able to in non dilutive grant funding for the early development of the technology. Um, once they got past the um, early prototype stage, uh, then that they had to raise. Um, Additional capital done through angel investors. Essentially, um, I mentioned the uh, chancellor, the former chancellor at Duke University, uh, and some uh, alumni at, at Duke University who are angel investors. Um, they participated uh, in a convertible note offering, and that convertible note offering was um, you know, it expanded uh, and then uh, brought on uh, some outside people from outside of the Duke ecosystem. Um, we brought on board uh, a seed stage venture capital firm, provided some funding, and uh, another angel network that consolidated the, the funds from several angels into a single investment into the company, uh, uh, constituted the, the investment um, to date. And we'll have another round of funding, uh, growth funding, coming from institutional VCs That's how we progress so far. It's from grants, non dilutive grants, to angel investors, seed stage VC, to a convertible note so far. Now, on your website, there's reference to, um, I think it's Verge Healthcare um, Investors. There, there's a relationship to J&J &J Labs, and there's mention of being involved with a med tech innovator. Um, I think I can understand the, the venture capital, but what's the relationship with J&J &J Labs and what is the MedTech Innovator? Yeah, well, just a quick comment. So I, I said a seed stage venture capital firm is Verge that, uh, that is identified on our, our website. Um, and then the other two uh, were competitive um, accelerator or partnership program. So Johnson & Johnson Innovation has, um, has an annual competition for bringing companies into its, um, its partnership program. And they have physical J-Labs locations uh, in different, probably seven or eight of them around the world. 
and there's been one in Houston for, for a long time, uh, but it's been focused more on surgical devices, and, uh, and then they have uh, one in San Diego that has been uh, more on uh, genomic and medicine and molecular biology, along with their healing. And then uh, uh, they opened one in Shanghai last summer, and uh, I was particularly interested in, in that one uh, because uh, it was a very diverse, uh, and it wasn't focused around a specific area. Uh, they do have a number of medical device companies that uh, had applied uh, for that, and, uh, and because of the size of the market, uh, I, I decided to focus on the J Labs back in Shanghai. So we went through a, a competitive process and were selected to be amongst a group of companies to work closely with Johnson & Johnson. Um, their chief scientific officer, Paul Stoffel, um, had been a, an entrepreneur uh, and started a company that led to the, one of the early and successful treatments for uh, human immunodeficiency virus or, or AIDS, um, the disease. And so his company was acquired by, uh, by Johnson & Johnson. And his personal experience uh, going through that process uh, has led him to conclude that uh, there is significant innovation going on in startup or early stage companies that large corporations can benefit from and that large corporations may not be the best environment for, for uh, breakthrough innovation. So they have a very uh, well-structured program to partner with early-stage companies that have promising um, products. And, and at some point, you know, they, they find uh, interest alignment um, making that selection. And there can be partnerships or even uh, acquisition by, by Johnson & Johnson. The other program, uh, the, the MedTech Innovator, is not tied to one company. Um, there, there are multiple companies. The, the founder of MedTech Innovator um, had previously been a serial entrepreneur who became a venture capitalist. Uh, and then, uh, as a venture capitalist, you know, had been looking at medical technology companies and saw that um, the scientists that were often the founders and leaders of those companies um, needed. Uh, lack the necessary experience and resources to take uh, something from lab development and regulatory approval and translate that into a commercial success. Um, and, and also sometimes in, in finding the right investment partners. So while he was still a venture capitalist, he created the MedTech Innovator uh, as a program to assist uh, med technology startup companies um, to get the resources they need to improve the chances for MedTech Innovator is a nonprofit organization based in Los Angeles, California, but it's global uh, with the presence of an office in Singapore and, and European office. And uh, they uh, have sponsors, including Johnson & Johnson uh, and a few other large corporations that cover the range of medical device and pharmaceuticals um, and digital health. And so um, MedTech Innovator also receives uh, applications through a competitive process and selects companies to become part of the partnership program and then we get paired with one of the corporate sponsors. And, um, in this case, uh, the Vigor is, is paired with a global medical device manufacturer. Okay. And so <clears throat> it's sort of a parallel type of relationship that we have with J&J and, and the MedTech Innovation Sponsor Company. Okay. And I mean, do they become sort of a a longer term business partner? Do they possibly take equity in the company, or are they just more like a a mentor to assist your development or integration into local market? <clears throat> so at a minimum, they perform the mentor role, um, but uh, they they oftentimes will enter into partnerships um, for manufacturing or distribution. Okay. Product development, and then uh, in a, uh, I don't remember the, the percentages, but, but I think it's at least 20% of the time companies will get acquired in this process. 
Okay, okay. So in, in three years time, how do you envisage vigor? Um, the, the primary thing that I can envision is that we'll have products that make a significant but beneficial impact on the lives of people with lung disease, that their um, quality of life will be improved, the disease will be better managed, um, so there will be greater cost efficiencies for the payers involved, um, greater health outcomes, quality of life for the patients involved. Um, and, but as I mentioned, uh, because of the partnerships that we're developing now, um, a, a number of outcomes uh, could occur. If, it, if our technology you know, commercialization is as successful as I hope it will be, then there's a very good likelihood, given the, the M&A environment that I've seen, merger and acquisition environment for good products, there's a good likelihood in three years' time we may have been acquired. Okay. Particularly, if you look at the, the technologies. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the, the acquisition or actually the merger of these two companies that went public. And we, I'm not sure if we will have an IPO in three years' time and uh, what our trajectory will be. Um, but, but I suspect that uh, looking at some other companies in the marketplace, again, the cardiology space, so as CEO, you're open to different outcomes, remaining independent privately, going to an IPO, or being acquired. You, you'd consider you're open to all of those different scenarios. Yes, yes, I, I am. Having, having been a startup CEO a few times around now, my first two companies were acquired, and uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very well versed with the alignment of interest of investors and shareholders and the focus on generating shareholder value. Uh, you know, we generate value for our customers um, and, and target the population, and we generate value for them, and we generate value for the shareholders, and, and the value for the shareholders realize the shareholders, depending on the type of shareholders, they may seek the liquidity of that. So, well, well aware of that, and if, if we do a, a good job in creating products and services for people, invested people, uh, then someone's going to, to recognize that value and want to do a, you know, they may create a liquid, liquidity event. Presumably, Vigor won't start generating revenue until after it's got the initial regulatory approvals. Is that correct? <clears throat> um, that's right, most most likely, but there's also a good likelihood that it can generate some revenues beforehand. Uh, I have conversations now with different organizations that are uh, very interested in investigational use um, of our products. So they. What I mean by that is they're not going to use it for diagnosing and staging the patients uh, for which you would have to have a regulatory approval to use a device in that manner. Instead, um, these might be academic or research, commercial research organizations that are simply trying to collect additional data um, to, to correlate and to do planning and perhaps to do um, modeling for these conditions uh, and also looking at the effectiveness of treatment. Um, so in other words, uh, patients won't be diagnosed and prescribed based on the numbers coming out of our products, uh, but the numbers coming out of our products will provide insight and intelligence uh, into other processes uh, that these uh, organizations are, are very interested in. Uh, okay. So um, there's a good likelihood that we'll be able to generate some revenue relationships prior to the regulatory approval. They would be sort of characterized as consultancy or research relationships? Yes, um, that, that's right. Primarily uh, research relationships. Okay, very interesting. Very interesting. So I think you, you've given very in-depth discussion of Vigor Medical System. And now I just want to sort of turn and see how 
it sort of fits into the industry and how do you categorize yourself um, as a subsector of the health industry, the technology industry? What, what is Vigor? Is it a technology company? Is it a healthcare company? What, what sort of SIC code could you attach to it or, or could you? need further refinement um, because this is a integration of um, some, some disciplines uh, or verticals and, uh, within the, the healthcare and technology spaces. Um, so the term digital health uh, has been applied to, to, to this area um, because our products are used by healthcare providers in healthcare delivery, and, but they're clearly technology tools information management, uh, that's the software component, the analytics component, uh, and then uh, the device uh, technology, the uh, proprietary ability to measure lung volumes and flow rates like without any parts. So, so it's an amalgamation of different areas and uh, the term digital health is, is probably the similar. It, it, it doesn't explain everything, but it's probably the, the single best term that's available in the market to describe what we're doing. Just, just, I have a personal curiosity of big public health care systems, and I, I have some knowledge of Canada and the UK, a little bit about China. Are public health systems quicker, slower to adapt these sort of new digital health than, than the private medical center? Can you make any generalization about the applications of digital health in either the private or public health care system? Yes, um, so historically, the uh, public um, health systems have focused on, uh, they're, they've been, first of all, safety net organizations. Um, and as such, uh, they focused on what I would call bread and butter care. Yeah. Um, the, the essential care. And oftentimes uh, that excludes uh, the latest technologies which have high price tags. So robotic surgeries, um, some of the latest medications um, that are, are very expensive have just been released in the market. They may not be utilized by some of the public health systems historically. Um, but uh, the, the crisis uh, Aging populations um, with uh, flat revenues in, in a lot of the country, or competition for resources from other sectors um, with increased budgets. Um, the, the mismatch in demand for health care and the ability to supply it by, by the government has caused some rethinking and forced innovation. So. The National Health Service in the UK has created a, an innovation division of collaborating uh, with companies producing new technology. Um, the US uh, the government, with its highest per capita expense for healthcare in the world, um, has also created some innovation programs. Uh, but primarily for the healthcare providers, uh, not necessarily for the technologies to work with the government. So that's also why you know, we're collaborating with some of the networking provider organizations to design some research programs where we can demonstrate the economic and, and clinical benefits um, of, of digital health solutions. So, so there is a transition that's occurring. And then I, I mentioned that the uh, Chinese government has funded some pilot projects for digital health programs around diabetes management and heart disease management. So, so we're starting to see in the, in the last few years situation um, has, is going to accelerate this as well, you know, at least for telemedicine, the, the, the ability to deliver care without people coming into a facility when they, when they pick up this more disease than they came in with, um, that, that's driving one aspect of technology adoption. But the cost that, are, that care for COVID has been placed, that's been placed on the government is also going to force more innovation and efficiency. 
Well, that's interesting. And I mean, I guess it's hard to have a conversation today without talking about COVID. Um, when I asked that question to the, the biopharma firm on Tuesday, what's been the impact of the pandemic on you? Has it accelerated business? And he, he said something to me that was new because I'm not a medical person. He said, it's been a problem because we've not been able to do our clinical trials as, as quickly because people aren't going to hospitals and that's that's slowed the whole process down. Um, now, do you have to go through clinical trials for for your device? And, and so what's been the impact of the COVID situation on the development of Vigor? positive and negative effects uh, from COVID. Um, uh, positive effects are that, um, uh, well, first of all, regarding the clinical research, um, we've already completed the uh, trials for our device and our technology. Uh, so, so we're not hampered in that uh, regard. Okay. And we've already submitted the data from these trials to regulatory agencies who have deemed it acceptable and have told us um, if you fulfilled your clinical trial requirements. Okay. So, so we're past that stage. Um, the, another positive is that um, some of the uh, research organizations that we're talking to, or they're specifically interested in our technologies, so that their research subjects will not have to come into the clinic or hospital to get their lung function measured. They can utilize our the patients, their research subjects, can utilize our devices in their homes and submit uh, the necessary data without having to go to the, the research site. Uh, so so uh, we, we provide a, a really valuable solution in that regard. Um, on, on the one negative side, uh, you know, in, in some of the countries where we have personnel, where we're doing some of our development work, um, the, the lockdowns, uh, people being told to stay at home for periods of time, have hindered some of our personnel from going there are offices where they have equipment. They can work from home with their laptops, but they don't have a large device for um, accuracy testing, for example. You know, they have to go to the, the lab to, to do the tuning of our, our product. And when they stay at home, they can't do that. So we've had small delays due to those situations. Okay. Other than that, uh, we have more positive benefits from COVID for our business. Okay. Okay. So that, that, that covers, I think, most of the healthcare industry. We sort of jumped ahead when we were talking about Vigor. You've already given a, a good overview of the association with Duke University and J Labs. So we don't need to um, repeat that. So let me just close off because we've just run a little bit over an hour and, and just sort of summarize and, and capsulize a few things you've said for the next, say, 18 months with regards to either funding, development, regulatory approval. What do you see as the key events and, and when do you see them happening? Yes, definitely regulatory approvals would be the highest priority key event uh, because that allows commercial marketing. Um, while we're working with the regulatory agencies, we're also working with uh, potential customers developing the, um, their uh, use cases and helping them uh, redesign their care processes to be focused around proactive management rather than reactive treatment of patients coming into the emergency department with the hospital line. So, so that they can achieve uh, better outcomes at lower cost. That, that's a mantra in the U.S. in particular these days. Um, and then the, uh, the other area is the development of, of partnerships with organizations that have interest aligned. So organizations that have uh, medications to treat lung diseases, um, they have interest alignment with us because we can help diagnose their products won't get sold to the doctor's diagnosed patient. And then their products won't get used properly uh, if there's not a way to measure the progress of the patient. So, so we help them, the companies with 
pharmaceutical products and achieve better outcomes, uh, and then uh, their customers will realize greater value in their products. So, so we're working on partnerships with those uh, organizations. You and said, also, sorry, go. And we're also looking at uh, other use cases specifically. Um, so uh, one of those is uh, any time that somebody undergoes general anesthesia for a surgery procedure, um, there's a, for, for more than 10 years now, there's a well-established uh, medical literature foundation, or a research foundation, for assessing a person's lung function first before you put them under general anesthesia for a surgical procedure. Mm. Uh, if somebody has uh, some conditions or abnormalities in lung function, best to know that in advance and plan proactively for the anesthesia rather than in the middle of the surgery the anesthesiologist noticed the patient's oxygen like dropping yeah. and other parameters going awry and then trying to find the right medications to correct the problem. So that, that results in post-operative complications which would be completely unrelated to the actual surgery and the patient will have the, uh, the torn uh, meniscus uh, and the knee other condition um, who was, none of the physicians realized that they also had an undiagnosed lung condition yeah. before the surgery until they had, the anesthesiologist had difficulty. So in, uh, in the U.S. and Europe, uh, there is a fairly regular adherence to a set of practice guidelines to assess lung function before surgery, but in the rest of the world, it is not done consistently yet at all. So uh, there's essential collaboration with the medical device companies and others in the vertical to, uh, to in screening patients on the disease before So we're looking at partnerships in that again as well. Okay. I'm getting unstable call connection again on WeChat. So let's, let's just summarize it and, and conclude now. You finished your clinical trials, but you're still thinking it's not going to be the second half of next year until you get regulatory approval. So another another year to wait for that. That's uh, that's our conservative estimate. Um, there are some potential opportunities for backtracking, um, but you know that's not guaranteed until the regulatory agency tells us that that's what they're going to do. Because uh, COVID um, is a primarily respiratory disease, it was many different problems. Uh, but the, the greatest morbidity or other is from lung infection, yeah. and respiratory failure. Uh, and uh, it, there have been many reports that patients' lung function, uh, they may recover completely and have you know, the virus body, but their lung function may, may still be abnormal three months and have um, the virus cleared. Body. So both for acute monitoring and for long-term evaluation progress, and the and the, the natural history of COVID infection, um, our product has been improved greatly in these areas, and so uh, there is some reasonable possibility of that. Okay. But uh, as the saying goes, we will not much of it before they have. And then on the final point, you said there will be another round of funding. I think you said it probably won't be this year. So will that be to increase staffing, increase technology? What what would the next round of funding be used for? Yes, it, it's uh, what we've called the growth funding. And so as we're doing the partnership development, we're creating plans with uh, partners that are executing those plans will require people you know, both on the partner side as well as on the bigger side. And so uh, we're able to create some plans with the staff and execute those plans and we just need additional personnel. And the funding would be to bring on those personnel before the revenue is generated. Okay. Very interesting. Thank you. One, two, one, two, three.